Hello, everyone. It's Jody Haddon Parija here. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry at the University of Delaware, where I hold the C. Eugene Bennett Early Career Chair of Chemistry. My research group specializes in computational virology, particularly in performing all atom molecular dynamics simulations of intact icosahedral capsids and virus like particles. That's right, entire complete capsids or virus like particles at fully atomistic resolution in an explicit solvent environment. So these are simulations that encompass millions of atoms, maybe tens of millions of constituent atoms, so they require some care to run. And today we have a few tips and tricks for you for running these simulations based on our group's experience. First, here are images of the three capsids my group currently works on, and they'll serve as the main example systems we'll use in the presentation today. On the left, this is a superfluorescent virus-like particle based on the capsid of the Brawl mosaic virus, which infects plants and it's decorated with hundreds of copies of a small fluorophore. The capsid is a T equals three icosahedron, and the system is about three million atoms in explicit solvent. In the center, this is the hepatitis B virus capsid, which I've worked on for nearly 10 years. It's a T equals four icosahedron, and the system is about six million atoms in explicit solvent. And on the right, this is the human papillomavirus capsid. It's the L1 protein virus-like particle, which is the main antigen in the anti-HPV vaccines. It's a T equals seven icosahedron, and the system is about 16 million atoms in explicit solvent. And as you'll see, despite all being icosahedral virus capsids, these systems all behave differently during simulations, and each requires special care to properly equilibrate and relax them to equilibrium conditions so that we could collect production sampling for further analysis. So for the purpose of this presentation, we're going to assume you already have the structure of your capsid or virus-like particle, whether it was derived from X-ray crystallography or cryo-electron microscopy, or whether it was something you produced by integrative modeling. We're going to assume that you already have your starting model. Now, the most important piece of advice we have, and you have to implement this from the very beginning, is to be very careful with your structure. That is, you must extensively check it for any structural issues because these large-scale simulations are too computationally expensive for you to realize you have structural artifacts only after you're well into production sampling. They're too expensive to redo. They require a lot of compute resources as well as wall clock time. So you really want to make sure from the beginning that you're careful and checking the details of the structure at every stage so that you don't have to go back and start over. Check your models. Check them at the modeling stage, after the minimization stage throughout the equilibration stage, check, 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 check everything. Now these structures can be difficult to check because they are so large. If you're used to running small simulations, say on the scale of hundreds of thousands of atoms, your solute is small enough that you probably did a lot of visual inspection to make sure the structure was okay and free from clashes with correct molecular geometries, et cetera, before you used it for any calculations. Now for virus capsids and virus-like particles, visual inspection remains an important aspect of checking the system. You should always, always visualize. But because the system is so large, it's going to be tricky to check absolutely everything by visual inspection. So you're going to need to incorporate some automated tools to help you assess the structure. All right, so atomic clashes, ring piercings, bad molecular geometries, these are the types of structural problems and artifacts you should be checking for. These things can sometimes be introduced if you're doing modeling to rebuild missing regions of the capsid that weren't resolved experimentally, or if you're doing flexible fitting to low resolution data, for example, you can introduce these types of things computationally, or they may be present in the original experimental structure. So be particularly aware of that. These macromolecular assemblies are so large and complex and flexible with so many degrees of freedom that low local resolution in the experimental data can lead to problems in the resulting structural models that get deposited. So you have to be sure to catch and correct any of these problems at this early stage, at the modeling stage, in order to run high quality simulations. Always make sure to launch your simulation from a robust model that you have thoroughly checked. There are many tools out there to perform structural checks and assessments on models to help you identify any of these issues, but here are a few that we commonly use. First, VMD has some plugins that can help. The measure contacts command can be used to detect close atomic contacts between two atom selections. Close contacts may be relatively minor issues that a minimizer will easily address, or they may be indicative indicative of more severe structural clashes, like the one you see shown on the right where you have major residue overlaps. Always check for close contacts and investigate them visually so you can determine how best to alleviate them, whether that be simply by minimization or through more involved modifications to the model. VMD's cis peptide plugin can detect peptide bonds that are in cis configuration rather than trans. Although cis peptides do occur naturally, they're relatively rare. 
When they occur, they usually involve a proline. Because cispeptides can arise from fitting atomic models to low-resolution structural data or from minimizing structures with really bad molecular geometries, it's always a good idea to check your model for them to make sure they were not introduced during your modeling work and to correct them if appropriate for your system. Ring piercings are a big problem. This happens when part of one molecule becomes trapped within the ring moiety of another. Your ring moiety may be a protein side chain, such as a tyrosine, a phenylalanine, or a tryptophan, or it could be in a small molecule, a lipid head group, or even if a glycan, if your capsid is glycosylated. You may end up with one protein side chain trapped through the ring of another, or the backbone going through the ring of a small molecule, something like that. These things typically arise during modeling when rebuilding missing regions of your protein or decorating them with glycans, for example. They are completely non-physical and you need to fix them. The Vermus lab at Michigan State recently released a VMD plugin to detect and address ring piercing artifacts called long bond eliminator. Typically, the bit of the residue that's penetrating through the ring of another ends up with an abnormally long bond as a result, and this plugin detects those. Beyond capabilities in software like VMD, there are other tools that can perform structure checks and provide a lot of useful information on the quality of your model. Mole probity is a very popular one and one we like in my group. It can detect all kinds of geometric issues in your system, atomic overlaps, rotomer outliers, etc., and let you know which residues they correspond to so you can check them out and see if they're going to be an issue for you. Going one step further, the Perigia Lab at University of Delaware released an automated structure refinement pipeline that uses Rosetta to correct geometric issues identified by mole probity, and it can even take in cryo-EM maps or NMR restraints to ensure the resulting model still matches the experimental data. These types of automated tools can be really useful uh, to help find and automatically fix these, uh, these problems in these very large capsid systems or virus-like particle models before they become a problem in the simulation stage of your project. And finally, everyone's favorite solution for fixing general geometric issues in a computational model, minimization. Often, this system-wide energy minimization that you're used to is sufficient to address problems in models, but just be mindful that you should try to have a good idea about what is going on in your structure before you just throw it to the minimizer, particularly so you can keep an eye on how it responds during energy minimization. Be careful because if the initial geometry is bad enough, the minimizer can actually worsen the situation or introduce new problems, like actually inducing a cispeptide, inverting a chiral center, or resolving an atomic clash, but at the cost of introducing interlocking loops or a ring-piercing artifact. Better is to know beforehand what the problematic regions of the model are, and you can always try a focused or targeted minimization only on those residues first, restraining everything else. Just always visualize and recheck the structure after minimization to make sure everything came out okay. For example, here's a severe clash that's present in the cryo-EM structure of the human papillomavirus at the, interface, at the interface of two chains in the asymmetric unit. In this case, the minimizer handled this issue beautifully for us, and we were quite lucky, but we paid close attention to this region before and after minimization to make sure in the end we produced a robust model to move forward with for simulation. Okay, so now that you've run some automated checks, perhaps some pre-minimization to address any structural issues, please do visualize the structure because sometimes the automated checks still miss things. Just because you don't have close contacts does not mean you don't have a catastrophic clash. Here's an example. Our initial model of the brown mosaic virus capsid with this fluorescent dye we modeled on had a bad atomic clash with the neighboring subunit. The student tried to eliminate it simply with energy minimization, and this is the result following the minimization. It actually induced a ring-piercing artifact with the protein backbone growing through the center of the dye. Now, this structure actually passes a check for close contacts, and the simulation actually runs just fine without crashing. The system energy appears normal because the artifact is a relatively small problem in a very large system, so everything seems okay, and it would be easy to assume that the model is in good shape. But thanks to careful visualization, we were able to catch this problem. So in addition to automated structural checks, we recommend to always do additional visual checks so you can catch catastrophic artifacts like these before you go on to collect simu simulation data that is physically invalid. See, sometimes because these capsules are so big, people can be intimidated to visualize them, or more often, they often they only visualize them for a very zoomed out perspective or only in a surface representation, and they miss these key atomistic details. So be careful, check everything, visualize, visualize zoomed in, visualize zoomed out, um, check everything because in all, in all atom modeling, all of these details do matter. Now, here's a trick. If your capsid or virus-like particle is icosahedral and the starting structure is symmetric, 
That is, if it's a symmetrized model, like most crystal structures and some cryo -EM structures are, then you can get away with visual inspection of a single asymmetric unit, one single asymmetric unit, that's 1 60th of the entire capsid. Now you should check the asymmetric unit as well as its interfaces to neighboring subunits. Often those problems you need extra steps to address are actually at these intercapsular interfaces between subunits, and you might miss them if you don't check both the asymmetric unit and its interfaces to neighboring subunits. See, here we have the hepatitis B capsid on the left and its asymmetric unit here on the right. The asymmetric unit is composed of four chains, that's two quasi-equivalent dimers, but only one of the four possible interdimer interfaces, the BC interface, is captured in the asymmetric unit. The other interfaces where A chains contact other A chains in the capsid pentamer and where the D chain caps the C chain and the B, the B chain caps the D chain in capsid hexamers, these are found at the interfaces between asymmetric units. So make sure to inspect a minimal fragment that captures all of these intersubunit interactions. That's the asymmetric unit and its neighbors, because if you only look at the asymmetric unit, you might be missing something. And while, sym while symmetry can play in your favor here, where you can get away with inspecting a relatively small subset of the symmetrized caps that are virus-like particle in the initial model, Asymmetric architecture also means that if you have a structural artifact, like a really bad clash or ring piercing, et cetera, you have that artifact 60 times across the icosahedral structure. So please do take care to closely inspect your starting model, run automated checks, visualize everything you can to make sure the model is ready to go for simulations. In the end, it's going to be the supercomputer doing the hard work of crunching the numbers and running the simulation, but it's the user's care with the details of these large scale models that's going to make the difference for a successful project. Okay, so now that you're confident in the integrity of your initial model, make sure to add hydrogens if you haven't already. Although molecular simulation file builders like T-Leaf or PSF Gen can add missing hydrogens based on their internal residue templates for the force field you're calling, that doesn't necessarily mean that this gives you an ideal result. We recommend using a program that can add hydrogens intelligently for your given pH conditions considering the surrounding structure, such that the hydrogen bonds apparent from heavy atom positions are in place prior to starting the simulation. Further, you get histidines with hydrogens in epsilon or delta positions, as the surrounding structure indicates, or protonated histidines, if that's appropriate. So use a program that can assign a protonation state based on the local pKa, considering the residue surrounding environment for the given pH conditions, such as PDB to PQR, PROPCA, PIPCA, etc. See, some of these virus capsids, they're pH sensitive, so it's important to build them as accurately as possible for the pH and other environmental conditions of interest so that you can make the most out of the simulations you're running. Remember that in regular classical simulations, pH just translates into the protonation state of the titratable residues. It's not some other system-wide variable that you set. It's meaningful at the residue level. So you wanna make sure you account for it when you build the system. Now that's assuming you aren't doing a constant pH simulation where the protonation state will be updated as the simulation progresses, which could be prohibitively expensive for a capsid or virus-like particle that's so large with so many titratable residues. Now, when you call these programs to assign protonation states and place hydrogens, make sure you provide as input a minimal fragment of your symmetrized particle, something that contains all the interfaces like the one we visualized in the previous slide to the local environment of all constituent changes in place to get an accurate prediction of local pKa. Okay, so the next thing we usually do once we have our complete capsid or virus-like particle model is to place local ions. Typically with these capsid simulations, we try to accurately model the solution environment, not just in terms of pH, but also in terms of any environmental salt concentration. Remember that a lot of virus capsids are very sensitive to the salinity of their environment. Their assembly may be dependent on ionic strength or the presence of certain ionic species, or their structural stability may depend on interaction with ions. Also, because biologically, virus capsids bind and package RNA or DNA genomes and nucleic acid oligomers carry large negative charge, your capsid may carry a large compensatory positive charge. So making sure your simulation system is not only neutralized and solvated in a solution with the desired salt concentration, but also has those important local ionic interactions in place is important. Now, if a region of your solute has a high local charge, ions can come out of bulk and localize there over time during the simulation, but our goal is to have these large systems as close to equilibrium as possible already before we start the simulation, because equilibration times are already likely to be very long, like tens or even hundreds of nanoseconds or more, as we'll show you in a few slides. So we want to try to get ion placement right in the initial model so we don't have to wait for that to also equilibrate during simulation. 
For placing local ions around the system, we like to use VMD's C ionize package. You tell C ionize a number of cations and anions to place, your positive and negative ions of interest, and it will place as many of those as make sense. And for any leftover, it will throw them to the edge of the box for you to remove from the system. Now, if your capsid has, for example, a net positive charge, that doesn't mean you should only run C ionize with your negative counter ions. You should run both. We aren't trying simply to neutralize the solute. We're trying to get a balanced local ionic environment in place before we solvate with our solution containing bulk ions. We find that some capsids, regardless of a large net charge, take both positive and negative local ions before it starts discarding extras to the box edge. So for example, here we have the results of running C ionized on the Brom mosaic virus capsid. Note how we have preserved the crystallographic magnesium ions. We know these are important for the structure of plant viruses, and this is the system, uh, including the magnesiums that we're going to use as input to C ionize. The system has a net charge that is heavily positive, so we ask for more negative ions, but also some positive ions just in case. It takes a little while to run on your workstation, and then you get this result in the center. See how we have both positive and neg negative ions thrown to the box edge, the ones that C ionize could place. They're not needed by your system. They're excess ions, so you can remove them from the system, but be sure you get an excess of both species so you know you gave C ionize enough ions to place so it could build a saturated and complete local ion environment around your capsid or VLP. And then we throw the extra ones away. We get the system we have here on the right. Okay, now we solve it. My group builds their capsid systems in BMD using PSF Gen, so we use the VMD solvate tool for that. It can build you a nice orthorhombic solvent box from smaller tiles pre-equilibrated at 298 Kelvin. It helps to center your capsid at the origin first, then measure its dimensions, then you can use that information to calculate an appropriate box size. Make sure the box you generate is big enough for your capsid or virus-like particle. We generally recommend you have at least 30 angstroms of padding between periodic copies, and you likely need to add extra padding in case your simulation box shrinks during equilibration. Here are some examples from three of our capsid systems, all in their simulation boxes built with the VMD Solvate plugin. Now, you might notice that our human papillomavirus capsid on the right, its simulation box is not a cube. That's right, it's a truncated octahedron. If your icosahedral virus like particle is sufficiently large using this box shape, which is supported by popular simulation engines like Amber, Gromax, and AMD. Using this box shape can really cut down on the number of atoms in the system. When we initially solvated our human papillomavirus capsid with a cubit box, we had about 21 million atoms, but using the truncated oct octahedron, we were able to reduce the system size to about 16 million atoms. So this represents a performance enhancement where we didn't make any compromises for our solute. We just cut down on the number of bulk waters needed in the calculation. Now, depending on the software you use to build your simulation box, you may have to create the truncated octahedron manually from a larger cubic box. So here's how you do that. Remember that a truncated octahedron has 14 faces. That's eight hexagonal faces and six square faces. The first thing you have to do is decide how much solvent buffer you want between your capsid and the hexagonal faces, since those faces will be closest to the capsid than the square faces. So your normal considerations for choosing box dimensions come into play here. Once you have that value, the distance you want between the capsid and the closest box edge for your initial simulation system, then you add the radius of your capsid to that. The resulting value, which we're calling D on this slide, is the distance from the center of the simulation box to the center of the hexagonal faces. This value will be half your shortest box width in the final truncated octahedron. So you need to build a cube with dimensions of D times the square root of 6, then you can use the following seven plane equations to slice the cube to produce the 14 faces of the truncated octahedron. And here's what it looks like when you do that. Two slices for every plane given by these equations. Again, where D is the distance between the box center and the hexagonal faces, which will represent half of your shortest box width. Okay, now that you've solvated your system, we need to add bulk ions to give a solution with the desired salt concentration. You probably noticed two slides ago that the example simulation boxes already included bulk ions. If you're going to generate your own truncated octahedron from a cube, we recommend adding the ions before you slice the system down. So for your project, it's important to consider what the system environment should be. Maybe you're going for physiological conditions where we generally use 150 millimolar sodium chloride, or you might be trying to mimic a buffer solution that your capsid or virus-like particles being stored or analyzed in during experiments. We can use VMD's auto-ionize plugin here. You just feed it your solvated system and it can add bulk ions to the water box. You can specify both the cations and the anions of your salt and the desired concentration and ask for your system to come out net neutral. 
Now, if you're trying to model a buffer with more than one salt species, you can simply run auto ionize twice. Here we have an example from my group's work where we have the Bro mosaic virus capsid with its local ions. In a SAMA buffer, SAMA buffer solution composed of both sodium chloride and magnesium chloride. So we first auto ionize with the sodium chloride, then run auto ionize again on the output of that to add the magnesium chloride to get the final buffer solution and a net neutral simulation system. Right, so now you have your capsid or virus-like particle ready for simulation. Of course, the first thing we always do is perform energy minimization on the system to give us the best chance of launching a stable simulation. This will deal with any remaining close contacts in the system, as well as let everything relax to the treatment of your force field. Now, as we emphasized at the beginning of the presentation, you ideally want to make sure you have any major issues with the system worked out before you get to this step. So hopefully your minimization runs smoothly. Here's some examples from capsids we've minimized before. Sometimes it takes fewer minimization cycles than you would expect for a system with so many degrees of freedom. Always a good idea to plot your potential energy when you assess the results of the minimization. And as mentioned earlier in the presentation, if there were any particular problematic regions you were hoping the minimizer would address for you, then definitely check those out afterwards, visualize the system again, and make sure everything is looking okay. Now it's time to launch your simulation. In my group, we like to be a little gentle with our capsids during the initial stages of simulation. We generally heat them up to the desired temperature gradually over say five nanoseconds with backbone restraints on, then gradually release the restraints over another five nanoseconds. In the past, we found that this gradual introduction of motion to the system helped us to overcome some close contacts and close residue interactions that were not completely resolved by minimization to avoid clashes, as well as generally preserve the quaternary structure and the detailed interactions between capsular interfaces, which is some of our capsids contain small molecules. But if you are crashing right away, like with a shake or rattle error, this probably means you have something blowing up in the system. So there was likely still some close contact or clash or bad geometry remaining that you'll have to go back and sort out. Now, another thing that can lead to a crash in these big systems is if the box size changes too rapidly. In that case, you may need to restart the simulation from the last computed box dimension. If you're using NAMD, you may also benefit from adding the margin parameter. This is used to increase the patch dimensions for NAMD's partitioning of the system. You can give it a few extra angstroms, and this may help you in the initial stages of getting your capsid up and running, especially as your box size adjusts. These first steps of dynamics can be very challenging. You're sort of trying to get this jumbo jet off of the ground, and it can be a struggle in the beginning if your starting system is very far from its equilibrium under the conditions you set for it in terms of the force field, environment, temperature, etc. It can help to introduce changes gradually. Importantly, if your simulation crashes, you should always diagnose exactly why it crashed and address that problem directly. Again, just because the simulation runs doesn't necessarily mean everything is okay. This goes back to checking the model carefully, including after each stage of the simulation. So also uh, be very careful. In addition to the modeling, be very careful with these early stages of your dynamics. All right, so once you have the system up and running and it's stable, you've reached your desired temperature, restraints have been removed, and the system is cooking along, you want to monitor a handful of properties to assess how the equilibration is progressing. In our experience, depending on how representative your starting model is for what the system wants to be at equilibrium, this could take tens or hundreds of nanoseconds. We've even had a capsule system where the crystal structure had bound small molecules and we removed them from the simulation. Over the course of the microsecond, the system never completely converged to what we expect for the apoform system. So depending on what capsid you're running and what the details are, structural equilibration can really take a long time. So during this stage, when we're waiting for the system to relax, prior to collecting production sampling, we need to monitor some key system properties to assure the simulation remains physically valid, and so we know that we can consider equilibration more or less complete. With small protein systems, people like to do root mean square deviation from the starting structure and leave it at that to assess equilibration and relaxation of the structure, but your virus-like particle simulation is this large macromolecular assembly with many degrees of freedom and an interior space, so it's quite a bit more complicated. In the next few slides, we'll have some advice for properties of interest to track to see how your simulation is progressing. One thing we always like to track for our capsids or virus-like particles is the volume of the space they contain. This gives, this gives us some indication of the evolution of the particle size as it relaxes and is also important for other properties we'll assess in upcoming slides. 
This is an example of the Braun mosaic virus capsid. This one compresses as it equilibrates, its internal volume decreases. We've seen other capsids like hepatitis B and human papillomavirus expand, so it can go either way for your system. It just depends. We've measured internal volume here using VMD's measurable interior function with fuzzy boundary detection. Now, for this analysis, using measure of all interior with fuzzy boundary detection, you have to spend some time first visualizing your system and selecting parameters to describe your molecular surface. The parameters you'll have to choose are radius scale, ISO value, and grid spacing. These are the normal parameters that describe the molecular surface representation in VMD's QuickSurf. We use different combinations selected for the case of each system. You also have to choose the number of rays to cast. And if fuzzy boundary detection is on, you'll have to choose what occlusion threshold you want to consider as denoting the interior of the container. If you're not using fuzzy boundary detection, you'll have to make sure your parameters result in a continuous molecular surface for the space classification to be accurate. So fuzzy boundary detection tends to be better for virus capsids because they often have pores around their symmetry vertices. And so we recommend fuzzy boundary detection for your capsids or virus-like particles. We published a paper on the Measure of All Interior tool a few years ago that I encourage you to check out that goes over all of these details and discusses how to parameterize your molecular surface for accurate classification of the space surrounding your container. But basically how it works is the space around the capsid container is voxelized and rays are cast from each voxel. And depending on whether those rays strike the molecular surface or escape to the exterior bounding box, the code detects whether the voxel is inside or outside of your capsid container. Based on that classification of the voxels, you can calculate container volume, as well as make atom selections using the internal and external space around the capsid. Here in red, applying this to our Braun mosaic virus capsid, we're showing a surface representation of the capsid's interior space, whose volume we're tracking in the plot. We use measure volunteer to reclassify the space for each frame of the trajectory as our structure relaxes during simulation. And as you can see, over time, the volume changes in size and shape. These bumps that you see on the capsid in the initial structure are because of the symmetric conformation of the capsids in terminal domains that we modeled in. But because these are disordered peptides, they lost that symmetry pre pretty quickly and they started to explore other conformations. And you see that reflected in the shape of the internal volume of the container after 67 nanoseconds. Another way you can measure container volume is by fitting a polyhedron to the capsid. We like to do this just to get a sense of the protein shell itself, in addition to the actual volume of the contained space around the molecular surface that Measure of Interior gives you. This shell volume, as we call it, tends to track pretty well with the radius of gyration of the capsid, which is also something you can measure quite easily in software like VMD. If you haven't figured out how to use Measure of Interior yet, or you're or how to fit a polyhedron in VMD, then radius of gyration can be a pretty great way to start. Of course, we are ultimately waiting for this value to plateau as evidence of structural convergence in our system and an indication that the capsid or virus-like particle has relaxed to equilibrium conditions. Another thing you can track, especially if you're using a polyhedron to measure your volume, is capsid sphericity. This is, a pro this is a property that we've used to characterize capsids that's also been applied to lipid vesicles and viral envelopes. It's a ratio of volume and surface area. We've done it before using polyhedrons fit to the capsid shell with one triangle per protein chain. Here's the equation for it using the volume and surface area of the polyhedron. And here's some data from some capsid systems and what they look like. At the top you see in beige, this is the Apoform HBV capsid simulation that we published in 2018, along with a series of other HBV capsids with small molecule assembly effectors bound in their intercapsomeric interfaces. And we see that these small molecules, they all lead to reduced sphericity of the capsid. In fact, they induce a faceted morphology consistent with observations from cryoelectron micrographs. Sphericity equals one for a perfect sphere and 0.967 for an idealized truncated icosahedron or 0.939 for a regular geometric icosahedron. We see all of our systems fall between these extremes. So sphericity is one way to assess, if coarsely, the morphology of your particle and how it's evolving over time as it relaxes. Note that in this example, sphericity as a property takes hundreds of nanoseconds to relax for our capsids that are affected by our small molecules. So again, structural equilibration of your capsid or virus-like particle could take a really long time. You just have to keep an eye on it. Another way you can assess structural convergence of the capsid is by doing a frame-to-frame -frame root mean square deviation calculation. That is, 
Measure pairwise RMSD between all frames in your trajectory to gauge when you start to see a conformational consensus. You can do this at the all atom level or using just the protein backbone or even using a coarser measure like the center of each pentamer and hexamer. Here I'm showing data for the HIV-1 capsid from a paper on its biophysical properties from Perigia and Schulten in 2017. The capsid's conical, not icosahedral, so there's no symmetric reference point. So a pairwise RMSD plot that considers the positions of the pentamers and hexamers was used to assess morphological, morphological convergence as the capsid relaxed to equal, equil equilibrium conditions during the simulation. Judging from this plot, the capsid has reached a structural consensus about after about 400 nanoseconds. So the remaining 800 nanoseconds were what was used for a production analysis. So these are just a few examples of things you can track over time for your capsid or for your virus-like particle to see how the simulation is progressing, how the structure is relaxing over time. There are many other properties you can measure, of course, and in general, if there's any particular property that you're planning to analyze from the production phases of your simulation, just keep an eye on it during equilibration phase so you know when it's leveled out. Okay, so beyond what the solute is doing as your system relaxes, you also need to pay attention to what the solvent is doing around it. In any MD simulation, you have to make sure that the box of the periodic cell fits your system without leaning to artifacts, that you satisfy the minimum image convention, etc. We know that regardless of system size, that if you're ultimately planning to run your simulation in the canonical ensemble or under NVT conditions, that you should cons that you should run at least some uh run at least for some time in the isothermal isobaric ensemble, that's the NPT ensemble or NPT conditions, so that your box dimensions can adjust to give you the correct solvent density. So either run in NPT, or if you're ultimately going to run in NVT, do some NPT first. You got to make sure you do at least some NPT so that your box size can adjust to give you the correct solvent density. And this is true with, with any with any simulation, and especially true with a capsid simulation, these are large systems with many degrees of freedom, and they can change a lot as they relax, and so the box size may need to adjust more than you expect. Remember that while some capsids contract as they relax, others expand. So if the capsid is expanding or the box size is shrinking as the system equilibrates or both is happening simultaneously, you may end up with a box dimensions that are too small to comfortably fit your system. Here's an example from our human papillomavirus work where we originally built a box that nicely fits the starting structure, but as the simulation progressed and we, we started to arrive towards equilibrium, we observed that the capsid was expanding while the box was decreasing in size and periodic images of the capsid were getting a little too close together. Notice that this, this can take tens of nanoseconds to observe, so you really do have to track it and keep a close watch. So we stopped the simulation. And we use VMD solvate plugin again to add a new layer of water around the capsid and around the existing solvent box. We added a new layer of water along with ions, so we retained the correct bolt salt concentration. And for atoms in the system that were already in the system, we used their current velocities to restart the simulation. And we only initially only initiated new velocities for newly added solvent molecules. So by adding this, this spot, stopping the simulation after we realized that the box dimensions were too small, by stopping the simulation and adding this new layer of water and, and ions, new layer of solvent, we were able to address or prevent a problem with the system without losing the equilibration time that we'd already invested and hopefully with minimal impact to our solute and its local environment. This is an approach that you may need to implement if you observe something similar happening in your capsid virus like particle simulation where over time you see that the box isn't fitting the system anymore. All right, so coupled to the box size is solvent density. This is, of course, an essential thing to get right for physical validity of the simulation. While your solvent density is probably just fine on the capsid exterior, remember that you have this contained interior space inside the capsid. And if the capsid is expanding or contracting, thus altering the volume of that contained space as the simulation progresses, then the number of solvent molecules inside must likewise adjust to maintain the correct density. And depending on how porous your caps it is, solvent molecules might not be able to move quickly between the, area, between the interior and exterior spaces to rapidly correct the density as the system relaxes. So you have to keep an eye, especially on the interior solvent density inside the capsid shell. Too few molecules inside, too few solvent molecules inside can lead to vacuum bubbles or voids, and too many can put a strain on your capsid shell. If you have waters coming out of the capsid between protein interfaces, you might want to check, double check that this is um, not an artifact of the internal water density being too high and actually forcing waters through the capsid unnaturally. 
So to monitor the solvent density, you can again use VMD, uh, the measure, measure volume theory tool in VMD to determine the internal volume of the capsid and count the number of solvent molecules within that space. You could also select a sphere of bulk solvent inside your capsid to get the density from that. But use this approach with the sphere with caution because you aren't getting details on the entire contained space and the problem could be manifesting close to the protein surface rather than in the bulk solvent. Here's an example where we use a series of spheres to examine solvent density in different regions of our system. And this was ultimately in agreement with what we got from Measure Ball Interior for the, uh, for the interior and exterior spaces. So we moved forward with this, uh, with this system equilibrating with confidence uh, that the internal solvent density was okay. If the density had been wrong and not resolving itself over not resolving itself over time, we would have had to stop the simulation and add or remove solvent molecules as appropriate. Because we start with a pre-equilibrated water box with the bulk ions distributed throughout, we tend to be pretty close from the start as long as the capsule doesn't expand or compress too much. But again, this is something you have to track and keep an eye on to make sure it comes out okay. Related to the ability of your internal solvent density to equilibrate is the rate of exchange of solvent molecules across the surface of the capsid or virus-like particle. This makes for an interesting analysis for your production trajectory since we find that capsids can be selectively permeable containers and exchange positively versus negatively charged species at different rates, but it's also a great way to assess whether your capsid is reaching an equilibrium with its solvent environment. Here on the left, we show inward versus outward water molecule exchange across the capsid surface for our Brill mosaic virus capsid. The slopes of these linear fits gives the computed rates. And we see that at, at first, more water molecules are moving outward than inward, which makes sense because our Brill mosaic virus capsid is compressing as it relaxes, resulting in a smaller internal volume as we examined on a previous slide. And water molecules move out to adjust the internal solvent density. But over time, the rates of inward and outward water exchange converge, indicating an equilibrium. So that's a good sign as we monitor the progress of our simulation. Generally, if your capsid has large pores and displays high solvent exchange rates, you're probably going to have an easier time with equilibrating the solvent inside the capsid container than if your capsid is non-porous and doesn't let solvent pass through fast enough to keep up with the rate at which the internal volume of the capsid is changing. Now you can use this same approach to measure ion exchange rates. Here on the right, we show a movie of the hepatitis B capsid. These are all the ions that start out inside the capsid at the beginning of the simulation. And as we observe the evolution of the system over the first 100 nanoseconds, which is about the time it takes for the capsid structure to relax to, simulate, to the simulation conditions, we notice that more sodium ions exchange to the capsid exterior than chloride ions. So you can see more yellow spheres are evident outside now than cyan spheres. And that's a trend that holds during the production phase of the simulation that we observed the capsid to exchange sodium at a rate nearly five times that of chloride. By comparison, the same analysis applied to the HIV-1 capsid show that it preferentially exchanged chloride. Chloride moves across the capsid surface at twice the rate of sodium. So this can be a really cool and informative analysis for, you, for your capsid or virus-like particle system to examine its interactions with the surrounding solvent environment and to take note of when those reach an equilibrium. This is another property that we track in my group using measure, the measure of all interior functionality of VMD, which allows us to classify the internal versus uh, the internal versus external spaces inside and outside of our capsid container and to use the resulting classification map that Measure Volunteer generates to make atom selections on the molecules found within or moving between these regions. We've previously published our application of this tool to measure solvent exchange rates before in the reference shown. So this and other examples of intact capsid or virus-like particle simulations will be a great resource for you to check out for additional guidance, information on what worked for each individual capsid system since they're all different, and other general tips and tricks for running and analyzing these types of simulations. So once you get to that point in the simulation where the structure and morphology of your capsid is stable and the capsid is equ in equilibrium with its solution environment, then you can generally consider yourself to now be collecting production sampling for further analysis. This is the exciting point of the project where you get to start making new discoveries. In my group, we really believe that the care you take with the initial model and getting it equilibrated are the most important and challenging parts of running capsid or virus like particle simulations. So we hope the ideas and resources presented here can be useful to you. So with that, I wish you best of luck with your simulations. I hope everyone learns a lot during this course and is able to collect beautiful trajectories describing the molecular dynamics of your virus-like particles, which are sure to be rich with important details related to the virus's biology or functions of the virus you'd like to harness for biotechnology applications. Remember that the supercomputer is going to be doing the hard work of crunching the numbers and actually running the simulation, but the users care with the system 
making sure the initial model is free of artifacts and the simulation system is brought to a stable equilibrium with its solution environment. That care is going to be the most important aspect for producing a simulation that you can do the best science with. So with that, again, good luck. Have a nice day. And as always, happy computing.